We play scary games for many reasons. For the unsettling environment, the thrill of being chased, or maybe just to be able to feel something again on a lonely Friday night, you know? <laughs> In this video, we're going to be looking into every gaming time period to analyze how its era-defining titles changed the horror landscape and paved the way for its descendants. So we're going to be starting all the way back, far into the distant past, about a hundred or so years ago. That's right, we're going to... While games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong were all the rage across arcades, there was something missing at the time. There really wasn't any game out there that was able to make players sweat out of fear and suspense. That is, until 3D Monster Maze. This is considered to be the very first horror game ever. Although, I don't know what's so scary about it. You're just going through a maze. Baby mice do it all the time. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Now, it may not look like much, the game is made up of 22 characters, but remember that video games were still a fairly new thing. It was a lot easier to impress people back then. If you were to time travel and show somebody in the 80s what ray tracing was, their coke filled brain wouldn't be able to comprehend what they're looking at and they die instantly. Probably also because of the coke. But still, the game's simple look actually kinda helps it, as the monster's silhouette lets the player's mind fill in the gaps. All while the lack of audio adds to the eeriness of the entire thing. Just imagine being a kid at the time playing this in your dark room at midnight. 3D Monster Maze really laid out the groundwork for so many future games. Every new maze is randomized, with the monster, a T-Rex, spawning randomly. If the player is further away, Rex will move slower, but if they're nearby, it'll get faster and it'll run directly at the player if it sees them. This is displayed using an anxiety meter of sorts that gives the player general info on where Rex is. They're also faster than Rex, so if they have a good idea of where they are in the maze, they should be able to outrun him as long as they don't hit a dead end. It's no surprise that with all these elements put together, especially for the time period it was developed in, the game was a commercial hit and has been praised even to this day for its mechanical achievements. Two years later, big screen characters made it to the digital world. We got our first licensed horror games with Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween, although they weren't exactly well received. In Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you go around as Leatherface chasing victims while trying not to bump into stuff or else you kind of just stand there for a bit. In Halloween, you're a babysitter trying to save some kids while avoiding Michael Myers. Wait, can I? No way, no way, oh my god, I'm actually looping him. <laughs> Both games, especially Halloween, were controversial for its, um, gore? If you could even call it that. But the controversy surrounding the titles were so bad that lots of stores even refused to carry them. This was partially what led to the publisher of both games, Wizard Video, to go bankrupt. During their liquidation, some copies of the Halloween game didn't even have labels, or they just had a white sticker with Halloween handwritten on it so the company could save money. That actually hurt them in the long run as it led to more stores not taking them in due to its poor appearance. It also really didn't help that the video game crash of 1983 was starting. If you don't know, that was when a combination of market oversaturation and poor quality led to the general public just losing interest in home console games. If the video game market never bounced back, these two could have been the last times we got our favorite horror characters in a game. But luckily, that wasn't the case. Alone in the Dark was the first ever true 3D horror game, and it became a trailblazer for the genre. Inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe, the game revolves around the player trapped in a mansion, trying to escape the monsters hunting them. Immediately, you see some familiar survival horror elements. The fixed camera angle not only allowed the devs to get around technical restraints, but it was also perfect for setting that type of confined atmosphere they were going for, as it leaves the player on edge if they can't see what's around the corner until they get there. The inventory system is limited and the space is determined by weight, forcing the player to only carry around the essentials and to think ahead for later. There are also puzzles that need to be solved using key items. All of these elements were first used in a horror setting right here, and it would go on to influence others such as Resident Evil.
Alone in the Dark walked so that Resident Evil could run. Released only years later, Resident Evil was able to use what worked well in Alone in the Dark and tremendously expand upon it. The Resident Evil game director, Shinji Mikami, even stated that if it wasn't for Alone in the Dark's influence, Resident Evil would have likely been a first-person shooter. Alongside that inspiration, it was also developed by Capcom, which surely had a much bigger budget for it considering they were already well known for other popular titles. Additionally, it was initially released for the PlayStation, which was quickly gaining popularity in the console gaming arena. The game itself, just like its spiritual predecessor, takes place in a mansion that the player has to navigate through using puzzles and key items. A big difference here though is the choice of playing as two different characters to get two different experiences. Players could go as either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, each having their own pros and cons. In terms of saving, because it was a console game, there were a lot more storage restraints than a PC game would have. So to get around that, the developers included safe rooms. Here, there's absolutely no danger, and that means nothing extra for the game to save. It's literally just a checkpoint. The player could save in this room, but only with ink ribbons, which were limited and scattered across the map. This ended up working really well because it pushed the player to come up with a plan. They don't know when the next save will be, but at the same time, they have to ration ammo and health to survive. Not just in the moment, but later on as well. On top of that, the room genuinely felt safe. As soon as you enter, you're met with a calmer piece of music, which almost seems out of place considering the game you're in. But it's a direct indicator that you are safe. Not only was this game celebrated for its cinematic storytelling and unnerving gameplay, but it also brought people's love for zombies back. Having zombies wasn't anything particularly groundbreaking in of itself, but up until that point, many depictions of zombies in general had supernatural origins. They rose up from the ground because of an ancient curse, or because a witch cast a spell to bring them back. What set Resident Evil zombies apart was that they were made from science. That added onto its fear factor because it made people stop and think, wait, can that actually happen? After this game, there was a massive surge of zombie stories in movies and books. It was even directly cited as a huge inspiration for the film 28 Days Later, while other top zombie creatives credited the game for the zombie resurgence. As far as its own legacy goes, the franchise would explode in popularity in the years to come. This was just merely the beginning for them as they would expand and adapt the world with sequels, live action films, CGI films, remakes, which we'll talk about later, and even a Netflix series that we don't need to talk about. Fun Leah's fact of the day, the Resident Evil remake for Wii was actually the first horror game I ever played, and I played it alone in the dark at the ripe mature age of 10. So I still see this dude sometimes in my dreams. <clears throat> Moving on. Silent Hill was Konami's response to Capcom's Resident Evil. Although, they went for a more atmospheric approach, as opposed to Resident Evil's action-packed sequences. Its story is about a man, Harry Mason, looking for his adopted daughter. After they get split up, he explores the town of Silent Hill while fighting off monsters and solving puzzles, all resulting in a number of different endings based on the player's actions. Harry wasn't some special officer or skilled fighter. He was just some guy, making him and his situation more relatable to the average player. That's also reflected in the gameplay. Harry can't take much damage. He breathes hard after running, and his aim isn't the best because he's not used to firing weapons. The game was also amongst the first to utilize a third-person camera view, breaking away from the fixed camera style that was standardized for survival horror games at the time. Although it did use real-time rendering for its 3D assets, it was still limited by the PlayStation's hardware. As a result, lots of areas are filled with fog and darkness to cover up those rough-looking graphics. That helped it tremendously as it only added to its eerie atmosphere. On release, it was met with critical success and was responsible for helping swap out the commonly used B-movie elements of the survival horror genre for a psychological horror approach. It would further ensure that its legacy would be cemented with the release of its sequels in the coming decade. The 2000s for horror was something I like to call the experimental era. While big titles like Resident Evil and Silent Hill continue to expand their world with banger after banger, smaller games are trying their best to stand out and make a name for themselves. At the time, most horror games gave the player guns or weapons to protect themselves, but one title dared to take a different approach.
Fatal Frame is incredibly unique due to the fact that the player uses an upgradable camera, called the Camera Obscura, to battle ghosts. The game's developers, seeing how well Silent Hill did, decided they want to create their own spin on survival horror. A lot of the game's direction came from the director using his own supernatural experiences alongside old Japanese folklore to set up a chilling environment and story. The player controls Miku Hinasaki as she tries to find her missing brother in a haunted mansion, fighting off camera shy spirits. That element it really was a breath of fresh air. That's especially the case because while the game has a partially fixed camera view, depending on where the player is moving, once the camera obscura is used, the player is forced to face off against the ghost in a first person point of view. During this time, they have to take a good picture of the ghost attacking them, with more damage being given the closer they are to the camera. Putting the camera element aside, there was nothing like that at the time where a horror game rewarded the player for getting up close and personal with an enemy, where that was the only way to survive. That may have worked a bit too well though, because according to the developers, there were lots of players that never got to finish the story due to how scary the game was. Once they got to work on the sequel, they tweaked the formula a bit to make a more compelling story in order to encourage players to complete it. That on top of other improvements, shot the franchise up in popularity and successfully staked its ground in the horror landscape, just like the developers originally set out to. Another title that had its own unique angle was Eternal Darkness, and that was with how it uses the player's own hardware against them. For context, the story goes back and forth between multiple locations and time periods, with the player controlling different characters as they try to fight off an ancient evil. As they find their way through the story, they could get over encumbered by the heaviest thing ever, their mind. If an enemy sees the player, their sanity level goes down. If he keeps on lowering, weird things start to happen in the game. What really made it stand out though, was that when the sanity meter was really low, the game would break the fourth wall in a number of ways. It would pretend that the channel was changed, or that the TV volume is being lowered, or even muted. Other effects were more drastic, like when it would show a blue screen of death, or when it would give the player a heart attack by fake deleting their entire save progress. This sanity system was so effective and got almost universal praise that Nintendo decided to pad it in. Although this might have just been for their own protection since other games were still luckily able to use similar sanity systems and fourth wall fakeouts without being sued by Nintendo's army of lawyers. Aside from traditional horror games like these, shooters were becoming more and more popular. It could be debated whether or not these games fall under the horror category, but there's no doubt that they borrow elements to add to their own atmospheres. While you're mostly just shooting in fear, it made great use of simple but powerful jump scares. Bioshock created an unsettling underwater environment full of violence and body horror. Not to mention the chills you get when you first hear. Dead Space set the bar for what cosmic horror was in video games, nailing down that feeling of being trapped in space with alien creatures that could come out and jump at you at any corner. And then, towards the end of the decade, we got... Although the first one came out almost exactly a year prior, Left 4 Dead 2 has had a much bigger impact and has successfully survived the test of time. It's personally a favorite of mine, so much so that it was actually one of the first games that I ever streamed years ago. By the way, I stream like every Monday and Friday over on twitch.tv forward slash Leah, so please come check it out, we can have some fun together. Anyway, the game's biggest draw being that, while you can play it solo, it's so much more fun with friends. It becomes a shared experience at that point, when you're all getting overwhelmed and then that dread kicks in when you realize that you just accidentally shot the witch. Additionally, the game is very replayable. It utilizes an artificial intelligence system called the AI director that was improved upon from the first game. Based on how the players are doing in a campaign, it'll spawn in enemies, weapons, items, and alter physical walls or the overall layout of the level. That ensures that no two games can ever be the same. Another reason it's lasted this long is because of the immense modding community behind it. There's truly something for every single player there. Whether you want to turn the scariness up to an 11, or if you just want to meme around. Going back to what I said about a communal experience, the whole internet gaming environment was about to change because it wasn't enough that people were enjoying games by themselves anymore. As a then growing platform's old slogan said, broadcast yourself.
More and more people were recording videos of their playthroughs, and the stars seemed to have aligned for some when Amnesia hit the scene. This game can be considered a kingmaker for helping launch the career of a few top creators. Its simple premise, one where the player can't fight back at all and must therefore either run or hide, made it entertaining to watch others play, to watch them get scared. But of course, these YouTubers couldn't just play one single game forever. They had to scope out indie lists, see what's new, what no one's played yet. Creepypastas thrived on the internet, so naturally, fans made games out of them. Arguably the biggest creepypasta, Slenderman, reached its internet peak when a game of it was released. A game where you couldn't look at what's chasing you no matter what. Then, it was Outlast's time to shine. Taking the best parts that made Amnesia work and increasing the tension throughout by adding a night mode camera element? That's just... Ah. Soon after that came... Uh... What's, what, what's going on? Five Nights at Freddy's, aside from the treasure trove of memes it's produced, was a really refreshing horror game for the time. While loud jump scares can be written off as somewhat cheap, FNAF turned that idea on its head. You know that jump scare is coming. The tension comes from trying to prevent it. Having to physically drag the cursor around, going back and forth between monitors to see where everyone is, made every single second count. As you probably know, this would be only the first of its series, with a whopping 7 mainline FNAF games being released in the 2010s, alongside other smaller projects. That is the effect that YouTubers have had and still have. Them playing or even talking about horror games like these popularized the games and exposed them to a wider audience. That's incredibly helpful for smaller developers who don't have the market marketing budget of AAA titles. Speaking of, let's take a look at what those games were up to during this period. As the popularity of zombies in video games started to dwindle, The Last of Us brought them back in a huge way. Taking inspiration from real life nature, these zombies, referred to as clickers, were based off of the cordyceps fungi that take over a host, which is usually a bug. But the developers thought, hey, what if that? but us. This alludes back to one of the reasons Resident Evil got so popular. The zombies exist due to science, this time through a fungus. Even though fungi can't infect people like that in the real world, it was still a very... oh. I'm just gonna pretend I didn't see that. This spin on the zombie genre brought with it a lot of new and creative approaches. There were areas of the game full of spores, whose mere existence poses a danger in the game world. These areas are darker and have more clickers around, forcing the player to take a stealthier approach than they usually would have, as the clickers are prone to noise. Getting around in areas like these while hearing creates such an unsettling feeling. That feeling is also amplified when you take into consideration how long it's been since these zombies turned. Their various stages and power reflect on the infection's age, ranging from a few hours or weeks, at which point the hosts are still conscious and aware of what's going on. You could even encounter instances where they're speaking in a terrified manner, or just straight up crying. They have no control over what they're doing, what they've done, and they're essentially prisoners of their own mind as the fungus slowly takes over that too. Clickers take at least a year to form. Bloaters take several. All these enemies are used in a way to remind the player just how much the deck is stacked against them. It's also worth noting that the game designer has gone on record to say that the tension and action was influenced by how Resident Evil 4 went about its combat. On August 12, 2024, a small indie company by the name of 7780 Studio published a small one-hour game demo on the PlayStation Store. It was an instant hit. Not only did it play all the right notes a horror game should play, but once it was completed, you saw the teaser for the main game. That's when it was revealed that it was actually developed by Hideo Kojima, with help from filmmaker Guillermo del Toro, starring Norman Reedus. And it's going to be in the Silent Hill franchise. The potential was was there. Based on all of that and how scary just the demo was, this could have been one of the greatest horror games of all time. Now, if you went into a coma on the 25th of April 2015 and are just coming out of it and watching this video to see what you missed out on and are confused as to why I'm talking about the game like this, I've got some bad news for you. On April 26th of that year, Guillermo del Toro at an event told people that the game had been cancelled. The following day, Norman Reedus also shared that news on Twitter. Then Konami, owner of the Silent Hill franchise, announced that PT will soon be removed from the PlayStation Store and confirmed that the Silent Hills game would be cancelled. 
Guillermo del Toro also revealed that famed horror manga artist Junji Ito would have worked on the project as well, most likely to design ghosts and enemies. The whole ordeal stemmed from Konami's treatment of Hideo Kojima, causing him to leave the company. Aside from making a very select eBay opportunist happy, the news of the cancellation upset everyone. Gamers got a hold of something amazing and were forced to watch it crumble before their eyes. The demo was praised for a reason. The player could only go down a hallway and into some rooms. In this claustrophobic setting, they were essentially helpless as there was no way to defend themselves against Lisa the ghost. As the player walks down a looping hallway, they explore what little they can to get clues on what's going on, solving puzzles to progress all while avoiding getting killed by Lisa. If they do, they have to start all over again. Throughout the demo, there's that lingering feeling that she's around and could be right behind at any moment. That's because she essentially was. Years later in 2019, a fan by the name of of Lance McDonald was able to hack into the demo to reveal the inner mechanics. The most notable one being that Lisa is behind the player after getting the flashlight. This causes weird shadows and her haunting noises to be more prominent, inciting a quick moment of suspense for the player right before they turn around to see that nothing's there. It's that type of attention to detail that unnerved everyone that played it. Even though it was just a demo, it's left such a huge mark on the horror genre, inspiring many games since. Alien Isolation does exactly as the title implies. It sets the player up alone and isolated on a space station. Set 15 years after the events of the first movie, the player takes control of Ellen Ripley's daughter, Amanda Ripley, as she tries to escape while being hunted down by a xenomorph. The game was originally set to be in third person, but it was switched to a first person point of view. This was because instead of having the player feel like they're taking care of a character, it'll be more personal, like it's them that has to survive. And that's pretty much all you can try to do. You have a track to get the general direction that the alien is in, but aside from that, there weren't any weapons or means of severely hurting it. It can't be killed, but if it catches you, that's a one-shot death. This game is the epitome of stealth horror for this, and how the AI works to spook the player. The developers really didn't want to make the jump scares, the close calls, that brush up against death, all that exciting stuff. They didn't want it to be scripted. That could become boring and predictable after a while. So instead, they implemented two AI systems. The one in charge is something akin to the Left 4 Dead AI director that was discussed earlier. It keeps track of where both the player and alien are, alongside how the player is doing. Based on that, it'll send the alien out to add some tension by giving it general information so as to get near the player. It also calculates when would be a good time to call it back. The devs aspired to not let that suspense factor be too much or too little. It had to be perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Meanwhile, the alien has its own AI system. It acts according to what the director is telling it and what the player's done in the immediate environment. Its system genuinely doesn't know where the player is, so it has to actively search for them. As the game goes on, the alien will actually exhibit new behaviors to make it seem like it's learning. This ensures that this cat and mouse place doesn't get old, and the alien remains a looming threat throughout the campaign. Until Dawn feels like a slasher film was converted into a video game. That's exactly what its devs sought out for it. To ensure that the game was actually scary, they, no joke, literally tested their playtesters. Wires were strapped to them to measure their levels of fear. The game itself is based almost entirely on choices, a lot of them being through quick time events. The butterfly effect is in full swing here. As you control eight different characters, you'll be prompted to make decisions that not only affect your current character, but their relationships and even the fate of of others. Every single character can live or die, and there's no going back either. The game uses an autosave system that prevents returning to an earlier save file when you get an undesired outcome. Because of all the different choices, there are a whopping 186 unique endings. That essentially ensures that even if you only replay it, let's say, three times, there's still so many variables there that you're guaranteed a different experience each playthrough. Aside from the story itself, in between each of its 10 chapters, the game the game does something that I personally can recall another choice based game doing. The story stops for a moment so that a psychiatrist can sort of talk to you, the player, about your fears and the choices you've been making so far. I accidentally got my favorite character killed and then got scolded for it. What the heck man? The setting for this also directly correlates with the progression of the story, as his office deteriorates more and more. It's for all of these reasons that Until Dawn is one of my horror favorites and I'm so glad they never went with its original premise of it being a PlayStation move exclusive for a younger audience. 
Dead by Daylight is the most popular multiplayer asymmetric horror out there, having sold over 50 million copies. But it wasn't always so successful. It had more humble beginnings back when it first started. Inspired by classic horror films, the developers wanted to bring out both sides of that on-screen experience. As the survivor that has to hide and run away, and as the killer that seeks them out. When it launched in 2016, it became an online horror hit, reaching over a million sales after two months. Soon after, it added its first new killer character, but it wasn't until around Halloween that its popularity really spiked for the first time. They were able to get Michael Myers, a horror film icon, into their game mere months after launching, and he was just the first to come. While they did still add original characters, it's their acquired licenses that made them stand out so much. Hey, that's insert favorite horror character here. Oh wow, they're gonna be in this? What is this game? I should check it out. I wonder what the community is like. Despite the many, 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 many hiccups in its history, alongside all the balancing issues that come from an online asymmetric, it's still chugging along fairly well. Just recently, as of this video, even acquiring the rights to add Alien into its roster, this game really was the one that's been leading the multiplayer asymmetric genre, inspiring other developers to try their hand at creating and running their own. In 2017, Resident Evil had a revival of sorts with its seventh mainline installment. This came five years after the last game, which didn't get the usual positive reception that a Resident Evil game would expect. To many, it felt like the franchise had forgotten where it came from and why fans loved it. Resident Evil 6 didn't really feel like a Resident Evil game. It was something more along the lines of an action shooter where you aim at creepy looking things on the screen. In order to get back to their roots of survival horror, they decided to take the game in a completely brand new direction for the series. For the first time ever, this was a Resident Evil game in a first person perspective. It also wouldn't have any previous characters from the franchise return, so the player would be controlling a completely brand new character. These decisions were brave but refreshing. While it did initially divide the fanbase, a lot of people, Resident Evil and general horror fans alike, were still excited. This was especially because the gameplay that was shown brought back memories of PT with a mix of Outlast added in. And it paid off. Resident Evil 7 was a critical success and that made Capcom much more comfortable with the Resident Evil 2 remake that was to come two years after in 2019. That one took what worked best in the original 1998 game and modernized it, taking in lots of feedback from the mixed reviewed Resident Evil 6. They doubled down on the survival horror aspects while still maintaining that claustrophobic feeling of the original. As a result, it did incredibly well. Resident Evil was officially back. Coming off of that great reception, more games and remakes for the franchise would be released in the... 2020 was definitely a year, but it was during this time that one horror game rose up to distract us from the horrors of the world with its own. Phasmophobia showed up and took the gaming world by storm. It fulfilled the fantasy of many horror enthusiasts. What if me and my friends could become ghost hunters? The team of players going to various locations with an array of tools. The goal? Figure out what type of spirit is haunting the area. You and your team can communicate with proximity chat and with walkie talkies, inciting players to split up and look for clues. As everyone explores, their sanity slowly lowers. The lower it gets, the higher the chance of ghost activity. During this, the ghost could start a hunt and manifest to go after players. In a hunt, the exit door locks, the lights in the room it's in will flicker, and electronic devices such as the walkie-talkie are rendered useless. If players want more of a challenge and to get the full ghost investigator immersion, there's difficulty levels and a VR mode that is not for the faint of heart. Everything that could go right for Phasmophobia did. Its early access was released during a pandemic lockdown, with many gamers stuck inside and with plenty of free time. Adding on to that was the heightened amount of people watching streamers for that same reason. When their favorite streamers started playing it in anticipation for the Halloween season, the game exploded in popularity. It reached the top 5 most viewed games on Twitch and it was the highest selling game on Steam for 3 weeks in a row. This was merely a sign of things to come, of the resurgence of indie horror. As streaming and YouTube grew even even more because of the pandemic, an increasing number of gamers were exposed to indie titles that got their initial traction from content creators. A big repeat of what happened about 10 years prior. Aside from the usual archetypes in modern horror, we've also been seeing liminal and VHS subgenres bloom across the internet as of late. But in regards to horror in general, we as humans have always been interested in these sorts of things. We pursue it despite knowing full well there's a chance our sleep will be affected by it. It enthralls, 
captivates, excites us. At the time of this recording, we're still only almost four years into this decade. There's already lots and lots to look forward to, but besides those, who knows what's in store for us? I've no doubt that the pandemic lockdowns gave many developers, professional and hobbyists, the chance to learn, to practice, to hone their craft. It's only a matter of time until another game comes along to shake the whole entire genre up. So until that happens, I need something from you. Yes, you. I want to experience more that this category has to offer us currently. So please, tell me about your favorite horror game, especially if I didn't talk about it here. I and everyone else looking for recommendations would very much appreciate that. Thanks for watching.